Good evening, hashtag our AERA GSE global family. This is Dre Abeda, coyote walking in this world, real life as Sleto Pueblo superhero, proud two-spirit indigenous warrior, and tonight chair of the American Education Research Association Graduate Student Council. Welcome to our January fireside chat. My partner in crime and amazing sister, Andy Layton, chair-elect of the AERA GSC, is tuning in soon, family. She is currently traveling, so please forgive her, but she's gonna be joining us in just a minute. Thank you so much for again joining us for our main event for January, our panel, hashtag superhero parents, celebrating the lived experiences of educational warriors thriving during COVID. Without further ado, family, let us allow our amazing panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. Who would like to get us started today? I can go first. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sangtri Paiochi. Sangtri Cordoba Paiochi. I am Taos Pueblo, Oglala Lakota, and married to Navajo. I'm zooming in from Bloomfield, New Mexico, the original lands of the Dine. I um, wanted to thank um, Dre for inviting me to this awesome fireside chat and looking forward to the conversation. Oh, um, I'm also a first semester student in the master's program at the University of New Mexico in Native American studies, where I focus on indigenous leadership um, sustainability and um, commu uh, community building. Thank you. Did you also mention your other superhero cape, helping the Democratic Party? Yes. Um, uh, through so many different associations that have invested and believed in me, um, I have been elected as the vice chair of the Native American Democratic Caucus of New Mexico also the vice chair of the Democratic Party of San Juan County, and I'm also the um, chairwoman of the Aztec Indian Education Committee, uh, where my kids go to school. Woohoo! Talk about a powerhouse family and the amazing mom, too. Who do we want to go next? Who would like to join? go next? I can go next. Hi, everyone. My name is Guadalupe Bright. I go by Lupe. I'm a doctoral student in education policy and leadership at Texas Tech University. I am zooming in from Columbus, Ohio, um, which is awesome. It's where I was born and raised. It's where my family's at. I have a little boy. Um, he is my life and my joy. Uh, I'm a hashtag loving and fierce mother. Um, as Dre put it, I am an ARA GSC outreach um, campus coordinator. Um, so reach out if you're interested. Um, I'll put that plug in. I um, let's see what I what do I do? I love research in education policy, focused on ELL immigrant and refugee students, specifically here right now in Columbus, Ohio, um, and how COVID nineteen has affected. ELL immigrant refugee populations, especially distance learning. And um, so that's kind of what I do. Thank you so much, sis. Rija, C, who would like to go next? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rija Su and um, I graduated uh, from the University of New Mexico, where I met my sis Andrea. I graduated in 2019 and I took two classes with Dr. Shiv Dissay as well, which I enjoyed so much. Um, I am currently an assistant professor at the, my hometown university. So I am back to Madagascar, my uh, native country and serving my community right there. It's a low cost, low, it's a low uh, income coastal town, town in Madagascar. And we have um, low uh, income families and uh, have a very few students who attend college and uh, graduate from there. So I'm so proud to be back 
at home and teaching uh, English uh, for um, specific purposes, mostly for business and for um, um, interpreter for inviting me to this um, a webinar. And um, we have not a very good uh, internet, internet connection, but I try Hello. Sorry, sis, we're losing you a little bit. Go out. So now I don't know if you can hear me, but thank you. Sis, maybe we should. Um, there we go. Let's try that. Maybe we'll try. Um, can you just try audio for a second? Does that a little bit better? Because you cut out for a minute. Sis, who are you talking to? Oh, sorry. That is our amazing co host tonight, Andy. But I was actually talking to Rija. Um, she's calling in okay. from Madagascar, and she's having a, we're having a little bit uh, technical difficulties tonight. Um, but we'll come back to Rija. Andy, since you tuned in, my partner in crime and our amazing, um, woohoo, one of our co-leaders, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick, sis? I know you're on the, on the road. All right. Thank you for joining us. I love you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Andy. Uh, you hear my sister. I love her and love you all for being here. I'm actually on the road. Uh, coming back from New York to see my mom, you know that it was a crazy storm. But I am a PhD student at Pennsylvania State University uh, studying educational leadership. And I think all of us are superheroes in our own right for just doing this damn work and surviving and keeping a smile on our faces during COVID. So I'm looking forward to the talk. I'm looking forward to hearing you all. And I just want you to know I'm so proud to just be a part of a wonderful group. Thank you so much, sis. Make sure you stay safe, please. See. Hello, baby. You have the floor, Steve. All right. My name is uh, Steve Desai. I'm an associate professor here at the University of New Mexico on Pueblo land. And uh, I'm in the Department of Teacher Education and leadership and policy. And I'll share some more about my research and stuff as we continue to talk. But thank you, Dre, for inviting us and looking forward to having this conversation. Thank you all. And family, I have to be honest, every single person on this panel means the world to me. They are literally not only my international family, but I worked with them. Um, they have mentored me, they have guided me, they have lifted me up. And that literally is how we are going to change the world family by um, supporting each other, by sharing our stories. Um, and tonight we are framing our discussion around this coyote's original indigenous critical race theory, walking as coyote. So as a true child of both my indigenous culture and that of modernity, I grew up reading both indigenous coyote trickster stories alongside fantastical comic book heroes. Longing for superpowers my own, I dreamt of flying amongst the stars and defending the innocent. And spoiler alert family, this coyote grew up to be a real life Isleto Pueblo superhero. Our very first tenant tonight is tenant one from ordinary to extraordinary, human to superhero, scholar to activist, the call for modern warriors and superheroes. Be fearless, seek truth, lead, protect, and remember the warrior's call. From our communities and families, our superheroes will emerge to fight, lead, and protect all our peoples. Like our indigenous ancestors who walked this world before us, from Crazy Horse, Charles Alexander Eastman, Geronimo, Chief Joseph, and my great-great-grandfather, Pablo Abeda, so too shall our leaders rise. Therefore, our superheroes shall be ordinary people who step up and become extraordinary during extreme times of need. As a very young girl, my grandmother was taken to Catholic schools and given to nuns. When my grandmother would not kneel to pray, the nuns locked her in a broom closet. 
This is where a formal Western style education begins in my family. I have spent most of my education, like my grandmother, refusing to kneel. That is from Bray Boy, Bill Bray refusing to kneel. Family, just like our leaders and our ancestors before us, our amazing superhero parents, they are warriors. And each one of them has my utmost respect, not only for the work that they do in our communities and academia, but their families as well. So tonight, family, we are going to be learning from their experiences and sharing that wealth with the world. So coming from Tenet One, from ordinary to extraordinary, calling our people to become modern day heroes, our question tonight is, all of you are not only amazing scholars, educators, and parents, but you're truly superheroes in real life. Can you please tell us a little bit more about your positionality, what your background, what is your background, research interest, and most importantly, tell us about your families. Let's go ahead and um, maybe go around in the same order so we kind of remember. I think Song Tree started us off. Awesome. I can you put the, the PowerPoint so I can look at the question? Um, but I will just start out um, with a, kind of a, some information about my two children, um, Cash and Sanchez Jr. They identify in New Mexico as special needs students. And in New Mexico, special needs also includes gifted students. So my son is a gifted student, um, which was a hard place to get to. Um, you know, the New Mexico is uh, 48th or 47th in the nation in education. And I feel that immensely, um, especially for cash, because he's the reason why I became um, an advocate, um, having to go before principals and school boards and, um, and feel the discrimination in New Mexico against children that are... Uh, you know, identify as special needs is heartbreaking. And so um, that's how I was promoted to become an advocate and a leader. Um, and thankfully I had, you know, the, my academic support at UNM in, the, in my undergrad um, in the Native American Studies program. And, you know, just learning about our core cultural values and everything really helped me power through and, um, and help me finish my bachelor's and then um, consider a master's program in law. Um, my research um, is dealing with equity councils. In New Mexico, we have the Yazi Martinez lawsuit, which is a big win for families and children. Um, it basically said that New Mexico is failing to provide a sufficient education for uh, um, special needs students, Native Americans, um, economically disadvantaged, which is basically anybody who qualifies for free or reduced lunch. And it's it's been um, a watershed moment where um, just today in the legislative session, um, I was able to advocate um, in support of House Bills 87, 88, and 90, which are uh, refer we call the Tribal Remedy Framework. And so it provides um, millions of dollars, 29 million for one bill um, to provide resources to tribal education departments so that they can manage their own language programs, their own culturally relevant education curriculum. Um, and they have been doing this, but out of like, you know, trailers um, and two bed, two room, you know, um, buildings on their res. And so I was, I'm happy to report that um, those three bills did get a due pass. And so they go on to the next committee and, and, and you know, get to be heard by different committees, um, both sides of the house, the Senate and the, and the house, uh, the Senate side and the house side. So, um, you know, but that doesn't go without opposition. There, there are, you know, parties out there that, you know, would rather uh, support a bill um, against critical race theory and just, um, so it is a constant fight every day, even personally, um, in my, in my, um, county, um, because of 
just particular interests that I have and people that I support, you know, there's candidates, you know, that want to see me resign. They've asked for my resignation and I'm like, no, you know, like my ancestors prayed for me to be in the places that I um, step into. And so um, we bring meaning and life and medicine to our people through our advocacy and we put the rubber to the road. And so um, that's, that's where I'm at. Thank you so much for your wisdom. That's so important. Um, and just to remind our family what our question is for this evening for our next speaker, um, my dear sister, Dr. Rijasu Abriamanyana. So can you tell us a little bit more about your positionality? What is your background, research interests? And more importantly, tell us about your amazing family. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to hear you. <laughs> You're muted, sis. Thank you so much for giving me the floor and for reminding me to mute because I'm trying to take care of the light and the power, you know, just in case things go. And yes, we are in Madagascar and I woke up at 3 a.m. today. Um, our panel is at 4 a.m. So I'm, I'm trying to be as um, awake as possible because um, this is something I, that is dear to me. Uh, this uh, is something that is very important to me to let the world know that um, there's that uh, global fight for justice and equity in education. So that's why uh, we are all here. I think that is the, um, uh, something that we share together. Um, <clears throat> I start with my um, family life because I uh, gave birth to four kids for five years in Madagascar. So my kids are like, they, they called it, I, I gave a birth like um, rabbits. And people ask me if we don't have TV, if I have something else in my mind uh, over than giving birth to children. And uh, a lot of people um, told me that I can't go far anywhere. And I wanted to, I love challenges. I said like, I'm gonna see, let's see who's gonna go far. So um, I went and uh, study, um, in the US, I left my four kids here behind with my children, with my husband, four kids under five people, and I pursued education. Yes, it took me 13 years to get the master's degree and PhD. And then I came back and telling my stories and my struggles to my people, because we are um, a small tribe on the coastal town of Madagascar that is very underestimated you know we are the minority we are the african side people with dark skin malagasy are more or less um, asian style and asian um, skin so um yes so my research interest lies around that like what type of education like what type of pedagogy shall we use uh, to get uh, uh, more successful uh, students from our community uh, to be um, uh, productive and to be the future generation for the, the, the country. So now I have uh, my latest uh, child now is um, 17. So three of them are in college at the University of New Mexico. So um, I'm so proud because um, uh, if uh, what people wanted for me was to fail then because I have too many children, but hey, hey, you don't do the fate of people. And um, I am so proud that I have a lot of children, which is very Malagasy. For us, that's our culture. You have a lot of kids and, but it's, it's um, I, I, I defeated the odds that I got the education and have a lot of children and still stick to my own traditional uh, let's see practices and languages and stuff and that's not very modern according to us and I try to tell the world I try to show my people that no you can be every everything so without compromising your identity your root your heritage so thanks again for giving me this opportunity because this means a lot for me and thank you for sharing Thank you, sis. 
Um, Lupe? Hi again, I'm Lupe. Um, let's see, I will start a little bit with my background. I am Latina, um, Mayan uh, background, um, and that and I grew up ELL, English language learner or English second language, um, whichever you refer to it as. Um, and so I always got pulled out, went to those classes. Um, and so that is what really got me interested in the pedagogy and in the um, research that I am interested in and that I do in with ELL students. Um, luckily, I, can, I came from a, a very low income household. Um, I was very fortunate to come out of that um, and very fortunate to no longer be ELL or classified as that. Um, English will always be my second language. I learned Spanish first. Um, my child is learning Spanish first. He's only nine months. We only we speak to him in Spanish as much as possible. Family speaks to him in Spanish. He listens to Spanish um, music when we sing to him. We read to him in Spanish. Even if the book's in English, we translate to him, to him in Spanish. That's really important to us. That part of our culture is really important to us. Um, and while, uh, you know, Mayan cultures in Mexico. I have worked with indigenous populations both here in South Dakota and in San Diego. Um, I worked in many parts of the country, um, but I'm finally settled down. Um, my child is developmentally delayed. Um, and um, you think the fight stops <laughs> when you're like, okay, great. Like I'm doing all this research. I'm, I'm, I've overcome the barrier of being classified as English language learner, being classified as low income, the fight doesn't stop there, it continues. It continues because my child's developmentally delayed and it took a fight to get him the services he needed because then we were told, you're, no, you're not low income, so you don't qualify for this program. It does not matter, my child's developmentally delayed. He needs the services, you can't deny us the services. Um, so if it's not for one reason that we're denied, it's for another reason. And so I'm very passionate about one, helping ELL families, low income families, um, indigenous families um, I've worked with, and just really um, any family that faces barriers, especially within the educational system and um, within developmentally delayed and disability system, uh, because there's so many barriers and so many um, injustices and um, that aren't being addressed, that aren't being solved. And so that's that's my passion and, that, and that's why. It comes from where I come from and it comes from my family and <laughs> the fact that I am fierce and that I will not be quiet. Like if that's the last thing. I'm pretty toned right now, pretty, pretty, keeping it pretty quiet. My son's in the other room. It's 8.30 at night here, he's sleeping, but um, when it comes to injustices, I will, I will go after them, <laughs> and then people don't like me. But that's okay. They don't have to like me, you know. They don't have to like you. You just have to do what you know is right for you, what you know is right um, in society, and that's what matters. So powerful. Thank you, sis. Andy, it's up. Uh, did you want to chime in? Yes, I will. I was going to, um, did everybody answer the question? Uh, we have one more speaker. All righty. Thank you. You're welcome, Dr. Desai? All right. Um, I guess I'll begin with my family and then talk about myself. Um, so I'm a father of three children. Um, my eldest is a high school freshman, uh, first year high school student here in Albuquerque Public Schools. Um, our second child is an ancestor now. We lost uh, Shiloh shortly after childbirth. Uh, but again, we, uh, you know, as an ancestor, he's always part of us, and we celebrate him in many different ways. And then my youngest is a kindergarten student in APS, and she's also special needs. 
Uh, I would say uh, just listening to the two other panelists, Santri and Lupe, it is a battle just to get services. Uh, she has <clears throat> autism as well as uh, health issues, uh, chronic lung disease. So going to school in person is a challenge. And, uh, you know, we, we literally, you know, APS didn't really have a plan for parents like us who didn't necessarily want their child um, in person because the vaccine wasn't out yet for her. Um, but even more importantly, you know, I, I keep thinking as I see news story after news story, why are we willing to sacrifice teachers, educators, staff, in schools as well as children. Like, I don't understand why in-person learning takes precedence over the safety and health of, of people. Um, and so that's something that, that, that bothers me, that drives me, that I keep thinking about. Um, and it's almost like uh, we're at a point where I don't feel like a superhero. I feel like uh, a, a defeated superhero because it's the same thing with the mask. I'm tired of telling people to wear a mask correctly. And I just, I just stop saying it now. Um, it's just exhausting. And then just, uh, just my positionality, I would say I'm from the South Asian diaspora, but there's a saying in Trinidad, I was born on the beach and taken by the waves. Uh, so I came to the States when I was literally um, a year and a half, uh, literally the bicentennial of the United States. That's when we arrived in the U.S., in New Jersey. Um, I was raised by my, grand my maternal grandparents for the first few years of my life. Um, you know, like Lupe, English language learner, English wasn't my first language, uh, then eventually I moved with my parents and we moved around a lot uh, throughout the states, you know, everywhere from Mississippi to Rhode Island to Texas, and then back to New Jersey. Uh, we've had a lot of blessings and a lot of setbacks. You know, we, we basically lived in a nice home in Texas and then my dad lost his job and we, <laughs> we moved to New Jersey and lived in a motel uh, where my parents and I were sharing a one bedroom motel room and my sisters had another room that they were sharing. And so one of the things that I always tell people is where I grew up in New Jersey was literally right across New York. And so hip hop uh, during the time that I grew up was a major component of my identity. Before anything I identify as a hip hop thing, um, and hip hop was my critical education. Uh, when we went to school, it was basically teachers, educators dismissing us and not acknowledging the richness of our diversity that was Jersey City. So many different languages, so many different cultures, so many different uh, traditions, and I was never acknowledged. But it was through hip hop that I learned about cultural freedom, about taking pride in my identity and, and so forth. And then I, I, in addition to hip hop, spoken word is where I learned about what it means to engage in democracy, what it means to engage in exerting your voice and not being afraid to share your voice. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, the lived experiences so, you know, family, this coyote is a critical race, whiteness, intersectional scholar, and coming from critical race theory, counter storytellings, coming from indigenous epistemologies, our lived experiences, our stories, sharing those with each other, that's starting a healing process, right? We're all going through a collective historic trauma. That's what COVID is. It's affecting all of our lives. Um, like C was saying, uh, education should never have been a death sentence. It should never have been a threat to our families, to our school children. Um, so again, thank you all very much. I know 
you don't always feel like heroes, but to someone you are, you absolutely always are. Um, we're gonna go ahead and go to our second tenant family. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the tenant. And then after that, my amazing co-host will go ahead and ask the questions. Our second tenant is harnessing superpowers and training with super tools. I think a hero is an ordinary individual who finds strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. Superman. As modern day superheroes, we call upon our superpowers and utilize our super tools to continue to lead, defend, and protect our families and communities. Our superpowers can include strength in our identities and the love and support of our families, our home languages, as well as the resiliency of our communities. Our sis Andy is going to take over with our second question. All right. And before I do, I just, I know you all can't see me, but as you all are talking and shared your story, I was just sitting here smiling and nodding my head because you all are powerful. And every time I, I hear you, I just, it just gives me hope. So thank you so much. And as we move to our next question, I'm going to read it slowly. So as parents and educators, what superpowers and super tools did or do you use to thrive during COVID? And I'll ask that again. As parents and educators, what superpowers and super tools did or do you use to thrive during COVID? Thank you so much, sis. Thanks. We're going to go ahead and again start with our amazing song tree. Thank you. Thank you for asking that awesome question because it pretty much um, is the basis of my undergrad. Um, oh, I remember politics of identity course and just learning about our core cultural values and the levels of cultural knowledge that we attain when we participate. Um, but this was denied to me because of federal policies of relocation and assimilation and growing up in Los Angeles, um, coming back, you know, doing full circle around um, the tribal colleges and ending up at UNM. Um, finding that program definitely helped me find my purpose, especially with the lived experience that I was going through at the time. Um, it definitely gave me, you know, superpower to understand, like, I'm the sixth generation from Chief Red Cloud. And he stood up, you know, he's on a postage stamp now, but and that's how people might see him. But like, just to study like the true history of where I come from, and what my ancestors suffered through, so that I could be here in this place, and that that's my superpower and um and I use it every day um so I just appreciate the the colleagues that I have um at UNM that empower me to continue doing what I do um fund different grants um and projects that I'm involved in um and and testify with them in in significant places like the Santa Fe Capitol today um for funding to go to um, higher education institutions in New Mexico. Um, and it's significant, especially when you tell, when people tell you, like, you have a voice that people listen to. Um, and nobody's told me that before, you know, but now that they can hear me um, speak to the barriers that my, my special needs children and I face, um, and then couple that with like current legislation and everything, it's, it's just so powerful. <laughs> Thank you so much. So again, focusing on superpowers and super t super tools, our sis Rija. Yes, um, I think I am um, more of a mother and um, educator uh, during this uh, <clears throat> COVID. And I adopt uh, the check often. So that means I check often with my people. I'm not used to do that before because I said like, hey, I'm busy, I have my own business. 
but you never know what people go through uh, these lately. And um, for example, um, what happened to the Miss USA 2019, you know, she seemed okay. We, we didn't know that. And people might undergo uh, hard times, but you never know. So I start to check, um, not much. I try, I try, but because before I never did that even for my own children. We are not from a culture like saying, oh, I love you. And we don't do that, but it's just, you know, our action and we work hard and, you know, check the homework and stuff from time to time. But now my, my son um, is taking uh, classes online now because COVID is hitting the country so hard. And then I start to pay close attention to details. When someone says, I'm okay, so that means there's something that is not right. So I, I ask if, you know, uh, what's going on if they want to share. And um, um, usually now, I think 90% of the households in Madagascar now got COVID, including myself. So you experience, it's a very hard disease. You start to get ache. Every, everywhere your head and I lost taste and smell for, I don't know, maybe five days on starting day six to day 12. And it, we don't have enough tests, but you just, you know, recognize the symptoms and you just treat, you know, you don't go, want to go to the hospital because at the clinic, there are 80 people lining up in each clinic to ask for um, that thing. So I pay attention to details. When my son says like, no, I don't feel well. So I, I stay alert. I, I ask more questions because during the regular time, if somebody doesn't feel well, maybe it's, you can say like, okay, okay, fine, get better soon. But during this time of uncertainty, I think we need to check um, often and then pay attention to details. And then the last thing is that I start to adopt to is react with love. Before I just, you know, like, no, I'm going to save my own love. I'm not going to spread my love. But sometimes that is what, what people need, right? Like love, even the word, even the little heart you sent in a private message, even the hug. I mean, this is, this is amazing. I've never known that because that's a Western culture, right? We, we don't do that. But now we are in desperate need of that. People are in desperate need of that because you don't know what's gonna happen next, right? So uh, I think I, I call them superpowers and the super tool because that's not, that's something I developed during this pandemic uh, time only. So am I influenced by the West? No, but we, we have love to our indigenous culture, our native culture have that, but I think now people and we and our community need it more than ever. So thank you. Thank you, sis. My dear, amazing sis Lupe, you're next. Okay, um, so I think one is, I'll start, I'll kind of start with research and it'll, it'll connect. Um, so part of my research was interviewing interviewing moms to tell their stories around COVID-19. And I think that that was really, really powerful because it gave these moms, and they were Spanish speaking because I speak Spanish, um, who felt they don't have a voice, have a voice. And that right there is powerful. You feel you don't have a voice already. It's COVID-19 and you feel even more secluded. And so now you have a voice to talk about what you feel is going on that's wrong within the education system of your child, the most precious thing to you. And so I think that that is one of my superpowers um, is listening to others and allowing them to tell their stories. Um, and <clears throat> The hard part is not getting emotional um, when they're telling their stories because some of these stories are really emotional. Um, and 
another one that I'm starting to develop and to learn is to allow myself to give myself a voice um, and to allow myself to be more vulnerable, especially around my home um, and allow myself to be able to say, I'm not okay today. Like, it's okay to not be okay today. Like, no one's okay all the time. And I am grieving today. I had some hard things happen in my life this past week. Um, and I am grieving. And it's okay. But in those hard times, I have always, especially um, during COVID, I've always relied on my family and my close friends. Those are the two things. And this past week, those are the two groups I have come um, have come to, either phone call or text or Zoom or through social media. But let me say this. When I say through social media, I, I say that very, um, I don't know how, to, I say that with caution. And I say that because um, too much social media can make you feel down and it's been proven. And I say that through social media because I say my family has like a Facebook family messenger page and they'll send each other messages and we'll call each other. And that's the social media I'm talking about because I don't need to see everybody's fake perfect lives so that then I feel sad and yeah. yes and blah about myself because I've been in pajamas all day because you don't go anywhere because you're in COVID and you do everything from home, okay? Um, I need to remind myself that I am smart, that I am beautiful, and that I'm a super mom and a super everything to my son. And that I don't need anyone or anything to bring me down. And that's all that matters. That I'm a super mom and a super everything to this super tiny human being who needs me during this COVID-19 time. So as long as we are, in my opinion, some way giving back to our community, to our family, and most importantly to ourselves, that is not selfish. Giving back to yourself is not selfish. And there is this stigma around giving back to yourself, feeling sorry about yourself. There is nothing wrong with being sad. There's nothing wrong with taking time for yourself. It is okay because we need it so we can be sane, so we can get back to our community, to our family, and to ourselves, and that we can keep moving forward, keep bringing our work forward, and keep doing what we need to do to help our people in our community move forward. And that's the only way that it's going to happen. And so that, you know, that I think that the, those things are important. And so during these hard times, I've always leaned on good family, good friends, and listening to others. Market that, or what do you call it? Copyright that, sis. <laughs> love it. I love it. Steve? <laughs> I would say <clears throat> my superpower has been I'm trying to think. <laughs> uh, well, I would say my superpower is being a parent. Basically, I've been doing uh, online schooling with my daughter. Like, I'm the one that's doing that. Um, you know, I'm privileged enough to have a job where I don't have to be in the office. I don't have to be in the field. And I can, you know, basically do schooling with my daughter. Um, is, I would say the, the super tool is realizing all these things that we used to do prior to COVID was, was meaningless. Like, uh, who says you gotta meet this deadline? Like, deadlines are artificial. I mean, there's certain things that you um, have to comply with um, because of the nature of the program I'm in. But other than that, you don't you don't necessarily have to do X, Y, and Z because that's that's the way it was done. Uh, I would say that's the other thing I keep pushing for 
And it's frustrating because people want to go back to normal. And I would say my superpower tool is refusing to allow people to go back to normal because normal wasn't healthy. Normal wasn't thriving for BIPOC communities. Normal didn't address our needs at all. Um, the other thing is, I uh, piggybacking on uh, what other people have said, like really being conscious of what is my, how do I spend my energy, right? I'm not gonna, it's okay to say no. You don't have to say yes to everything. You don't have to be a super, uh, superhuman, right? You can take time for yourself. You can do a lot of uh, meditation activities and be attuned to your mind, body, spirit. So I would say that's what I've been doing. Uh, BIPOC is uh, Black, Indigenous, People of Color. Thank you all so much. We're going to go ahead and go to our tenant three today, which is beware kryptonite. Even superheroes need balance. And some of you are starting to address that idea of balance. Why do we fall, sir? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up by one of my favorites, Alfred Pennyworth. All superheroes have a weakness. As modern day heroes of all of our communities, we have a responsibility to maintain a humanizing balance between our mind, body, and spirit, lest we lose our superpowers. My sole problem at Dartmouth was that I did not possess self-confidence. I often looked down on myself, thinking I wasn't good enough, smart enough, sophisticated enough, or rich, or whatever. It took time for me to rise above my self-defeating attitude. By Davina Ruth Begay Two Bears, I Walk in Beauty. So family, our amazing sis Andy is going to follow up with our questions for our panel. Okay, everyone. That was just powerful. Um, wow. Wow. Okay, question three. Alrighty, this is a long one, so I'm going to take my time. Okay, so before and during COVID, how do you maintain a humanizing balance between your mind, your body, and your spirit while parenting? How are you managing your lives and supporting your loved ones? We just want to know how are you doing it all? And I'll repeat it one more time. So before and during COVID, how do you maintain a humanizing balance between your mind, body, and spirit? While you're parenting, how are you managing your lives and how are you supporting your loved ones? We just want to know how are you doing all of this? And I guess we can do a rotation. You want to switch it around, sis, instead of starting from A, we can start from the back instead of starting from the front. Sounds good to me. So that means, uh, Steve, you're in the hot seat. <laughs> I see the question again. Absolutely. Sure thing. Okay, so uh, before and during COVID, how are you maintaining balance between your mind, body, and spirit while parenting? How are you managing your life and supporting your loved ones? And we just want to know how are you doing it all? Um. I would say before COVID, there wasn't a balance. Before COVID, it was, you know, I was in a tenure track position, so everything was work, 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 trying to get publications, trying to get grants, trying to get uh, good valuations on, on your teaching and all that stuff, making sure you're doing service. So it was kind of work. Um, but I would say 
it wasn't too warm because again going back to my daughter um you know she she was born at uh i want to say 26 weeks or 24 weeks uh, so she was a micro preemie and so as soon as that happened everything paused uh, and i was like well i don't need to do all this stuff that i was doing and the most important thing was to make sure we were there for her and uh, nurturing her to help. Um, and I would say that's probably the toughest thing about having a special needs child uh, because all your focus and energy goes through her. And sometimes your other children may feel a little neglected. Uh, so you got to make sure that you do little activities with them as well. And so that there is that balance uh, of trying to making sure that each child feels loved and supported. Uh, but we're lucky that my oldest son, he basically saw his younger sibling die. So he knows firsthand what it means to lose a sibling and what it means um, to try to do everything in your power to make sure that your other sibling can thrive. Um, I would say. You know, one of the beautiful things about COVID was forcing, particularly when we had the lockdown, was families being forced to be with each other, whether they wanted to or not. Um, and that that was a wonderful experience because we got to do things that we never did before, like go on hikes, go on walks, cooking together, um, eating together. I can't tell you how before COVID, sometimes my wife and I would never even see each other during the week sometimes um, because of the nature of her job. Sometimes uh, at UNM, I teach at night, so we don't necessarily cross paths. And then supporting your loved ones, I would say that's what's getting me through. Like, how can I support my loved ones? Um, I can, you know, my son's in high school, he's about to go to college in three years, uh, making sure he understands what's going on and not being afraid to ask questions. Uh, he's actually reading uh, Delgado and Stefanisic, uh, uh, Intro to CRT, that book. <laughs> he's doing it for his school. Uh, it was kind of cool because he had, he's, he and I talk about what's been going on. And that's, that's the other thing that's, that's, that drives me is, is fighting for us. Because it's like what Fannie Lou Hamer said, or I forgot who said that, I'm tired. I'm tired of being tired, right? I'm tired of certain parents feeling like their feelings matter more than us. I'm tired of certain communities thinking that they can't handle such and such because it's gonna hurt their children. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm willing to go all out for our kids and making sure that we stand up and fight for, for us. And you know, it's the same fight that we always have. It doesn't matter. Like I've seen it from the, from the 80s to now and even before the 80s. Um, in the 60s, the student walkouts to, that led to really ethnic studies uh, as the same fight that we're doing over and over again. And like Sanchi said, you know, we had this historic court case of Martinez Yazi, Yazi, Yazi Martinez. Like we got to make sure that we hold the people in power accountable for that. So that's, that's what I do. That's what maintains me. Thank you so much. So going to Lupe, Again, maintaining that human body's in balance between your mind, body, and spirit. How do you do it all, Lupe? All right, so one is um, my religion's really important to me. It helps keep me balanced. It reminds me of what's important, um, what matters, my values. Uh, it's what centers my family. Um, it's how uh, my son, my husband, and I uh, spend time together. Um, and uh, every morning, every evening, we have family prayer, every meal, 
Right now we have family prayer um, as my husband works from home. So we have that privilege. Um, and if he didn't, it would be um, when, um, it would be dinner when we, sometimes he travels. So we would connect via FaceTime or whatnot. Um, <clears throat> how do I support my loved one? Um, as you know, my son, we, I support him through his um, early interventions and just spending time with him. Like, you know, if he wants cuddles, cuddles come before doing my makeup or my hair or whatever. Like those are more important to me than making sure I look great when I go grocery shopping. Who cares how you look? Who cares how I look when I show up to Zoom in class? Like who cares? Who, no one's going to remember in five years how I looked that one day in class um, when I showed up with baby barf on my shoulder or whatnot. Like, no one cares, um, you know? And um, another thing is we have date night, my husband and I, on Fridays. It's now family night since we have our son, but it's every Friday. And my family knows Fridays because we're Latino. Our door is literally unlocked all the time, 24 seven. They come in, it's locked around eight now that he is, um, um, that he is younger. We're like, you can't come at after eight because he's asleep and if you wake him, you're in trouble. Um, but we're Latino and that's how it is in the Latino community. You come and go and you do not announce yourself. Like you, you don't make a phone call and you're not like, hey, can I come at 5 p.m. on Tuesday, um, February 10th? It doesn't work that way. You show up, oh, hey, I was around the, I was near the, nearby you weren't nearby, you were way over there, like 30 minutes away. You just wanted to come by, you know, <laughs> or maybe you were. Um, and so, but they know Friday, I said, I said, Friday, look, it is in our culture, but Friday, it's my family, just our little family. That's it. Nobody comes. You come, it, you better be dying. And so they've learned to respect that because it's just my son, my husband and I, and we just goof around. And that is just how we've bonded. Um, and what I've learned is, and I think I put this in the chat, is I choose my priorities because if not, someone else would choose the priorities for me. Someone else will put that and be like, hey, can you do that for me? Can you do that? Oh, we need you to do this. You know, um, and especially in academia, there's always this pressure. Um, I think Shiv said, Shiv said this, um, you know, publications, research, more publications, papers, deadlines, this and that, especially as a student, you're like, okay, I need a research, I need to publish, I need to do this, I need to do that. I need to go to this conference and that conference and I need to present. And I've been very blessed. Um, I've done research, I'm working, I've had one publication, um, I'm fourth author, but it's a publication, I'm working on another one, um, and I am presenting at a, another conference here, it's like my fourth, I don't even know, and those have just been, I don't know, I feel like handed to me by, by higher power, um, but the one thing I've learned is that at the end of the day, that does not matter. Because at the end of the day, my son does not care how many publications I come home with. He does not care how many trophies I come home with. He just cares how much time mommy spent with him that day. And that is what matters. My family does not. I mean, yeah, they care and they're proud of me. But at the end of the day, what do I value? What do I care? Do I care about the publications more than I care about my family values? You know, and some of us might. Some of us might, some of us might need to be the breadwinners, or some of us might need to really care about those publications just as much as our family. And that, you know, it's just as important. And that does not mean that you're any more or any less. That just means that, that is your life situation. My life situation right now is that my son needs me so that we can get him to a place where he is caught up somewhat developmentally or hopefully we can catch him up by age two is the goal you know and so we all pick our priorities um and so that that's where I'm at I, I hope I answered the question um and that's you know that's kind of how I choose my balance and with my mind body and spirit 
And the other thing I do is every morning I get up an hour before my son does and it's me time. And it is just like, it's me time. My son, my husband gets up and it's, he does his thing. I do my thing. And in the evening we put him to bed early and it's me time for an hour. And it, my husband does his thing for an hour. And then we come together because that's what I need. And so it's finding also what you need and getting that for yourself, I think is important. <laughs> Wow. So beautiful. Sis Rija? Okay. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the floor. Um, I'm going to start with my kids again because I'm, I'm selfish. I, um, I raised my kids to be independent. When you have four kids, like it's almost the same age, separate, you know, not almost, but um, it's hard to take care of them. So I just teach them to be independent. Only uh, ask me when needed. And my kids know that I don't want to be bothered. I said I was selfish because I did my school and my husband took care of the kids. So no issues should be brought to me because I, I got very mad. So I used to take good care of myself, good shape, you know, do that because you got kids, but they don't need, uh, no, they do need my attention, but I just neglected them, I guess. I need to take the blame for that. So now the kids are closer to their dad than to me, but that's okay. Too bad, but that's okay. That's the reality. I'm still their mama. And I got, I did sports and, you know, like um, everything I took good care of my myself until COVID came. And even if COVID came, I still found time to take care of myself until I got sick. So now I, get, I gained some little weight. You know, I'm not a very in a good shape that I want, but, and I, I feel like I'm weak. I'm not the usual me. I want to go back to normal. Unfortunately, Dr. Jise, I want to go back to normal, but I, I, I don't think I can. This is a the time for survival. Like, can we make it? Can I make this? Who can, how can we, you know, move forward, right? So I just said like, okay, this is survival time. Man, if I survive, even if I, 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 I wrote like three days in pajamas, yes, imagine. So that was my, me before, like two hours before this uh, webinar. Like I, I didn't even want to change my pajamas before see how, I don't know if that's, you interpret that, but I said, like, I don't have to go anywhere. And I, I am privileged too. I can work from home and everything. So, and, but the good thing with COVID is um, I, I got to connect with my children. Uh, when I was the secretary of education in Madagascar and my kids, two of my kids were in, um, in uh, the US and I talked to them for less than 49 seconds every time. And then when I was fired, they said, oh, it's been two hours since we chatted on Messenger. So you are, you are free. So meaning like this COVID time connects, has connected me with um, my family, right? Because I'm always home and I know I, I started to talk. We created even a group chat for my kids so that we can exchange. And because you need to find something else you're going to be there together even if they are not necessarily physically present but you are forced as uh, dr dice and um lupe and song tree uh, mentioned earlier you need to you know like uh be together and um however my problem with this is uh the limit right i i, I feel like i need to hear or to listen to people to show that i care but my body can't take it Right, like I the last time I was rushed to the hospital was last Thursday because I wanted we, we got a very bad flood here and less than a mile from my home there's a, a big flood right there with four canoes. People got to go to their home in, in, in their yard using canoes, and I was right there. And I was like, oh my gosh, so this is really because I, again, in, in times of um, uh, catastrophe like that, I hide in my house. 
I just saw the news on TV because I didn't want to take it, right? Because on TV, maybe you are far. But then I went out and they said, like, instead of going to the supermarket, I'm going to give my money to the little grocery stores who were closed for a while. So I went there and then they said, oh, we lost our uh, home. We are ref refugees. We stay at the school. And another one, oh, we went here at the butchers. We went here uh, using the canoe. And they was like, where do you live now? Oh, we are neighbors. And they was like, are you sure? It was like, I told my husband, let's go there. And gosh, you, I was speechless. It's like ocean. So the, the depth is about three meters. I don't know if you know in inches, I don't know, but three meters. That's how people, and less than a mile from where I live. And that night, that was the last thing in my mind. And I got spasma. That's what the doctor explained. Like I needed, I should have, listen to some music and everything. So my problem with this COVID time is I need as I want to listen to people, but I want to hear you sick once. Right. And I didn't want to check on you anymore until after a while because it it eats me. I don't know if that's but that's me. I can't stand it. It it was too much and and um I guess that's a selfishness again, because I used to take care of myself. That's not the best, but I don't have a choice, right? And so I guess uh, the most important thing is um, that I would like to tell people is we are on a survival mood, uh, on a survival, um, yes, mode, sorry, mode. So um, you do whatever you do to survive because you never know. This is a real serious disease and the phenomena that it brings is hard and the post COVID is, is hard too. Now, I, you know, after you talk, uh, I still feel that I'm still weak, but I'm okay, I can do this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing, sis. I mean, I think that's also really important. Definitely check out our podcast family, um, Coyote's family of global superheroes. But Rija basically tells it like it is. And she always humanizes, reminds me um, that being in the United States means that we are very privileged, um, especially, you know, I talk about intersectionality and class privilege during my blogging doctoral dissertation project. But in the United States, even our poorest people have resources um, that most of the world can only dream of. Um, and I know that's hard to hear during COVID when we do have our own issues with joblessness, housing, job security um and debt we have so much debt including medical bills family um and so thank you so much Rija for sharing your experiences with us um sis Santri, how do you maintain a humanizing balance between your mind body and spirit I was lucky enough to um and, and you made me think of this, um, Lupe, going to different conferences and things like that. Um, I went to this local conference and heard a presentation by the Native American Community Academy. This local high school, um, actually it's, um, it, it's grown down to like fourth grade and up. But anyway, um, they did this exercise and it was like a wellness wheel. Um, divided into like intellectual wellness, physical wellness. I actually went and found it. I'm all digging through my papers. I'm like, where is that thing? Um, so intellectual wellness, physical wellness, social emotional wellness, and community and relationship wellness. And we had to like, um, you know, grade ourselves one through five and then shade in, you know, shade it in. And um, it, and the, ba the point of that basically was like, if, if one of your wheels is flat or, you know, it's not in alignment with the other parts of your wellness, you're going to have a bumpy ride or you might get stuck, you know? Um, and so that, that was huge to me. I always think about that now when, um, especially um, being type two diabetic um, and not really going through the shock of learning that I, I got to that point, you know, I let myself go and didn't heed the warnings about sugar or even, you know, my mom being a diabetic, um, just, and then blaming it on society, you know, because growing up on fast food and, and just with working parents and, you know, commodities and things like that. Um, I never put my 
personal uh, nutritional health um, as a priority until recently. And so I think about that. And then another thing um, is being an advocate um, takes a lot of work. Like it, it's, it's so hard mentally because you have to, you know, power up from within. And if you don't have, if you're not well, you know, in any, any aspect of physical wellness or, you know, whatever, um, that just makes you want to stay in bed and do nothing, you know, and, but you still have children, especially during COVID when we had to be their teachers, you know, and when the school districts were trying to figure out how to teach remotely, um, trying to figure out how to teach kids that don't have internet, don't have laptops, you know, and, and I know you guys, you, everybody probably felt that too. Um, but that, that um, training that I had that day really kept me focused sometimes, you know, and um, also um, I found out, yes, that my family needs me, but I need them too. So, um, you know, you always see these politicians and stuff with like the perfect family and the perfect family picture. And I was like, and that really surfaced during, I, I ran for school board recently and um, I didn't have any help from my husband. Um, I had my kids helping me, but I didn't have any help from him. And that really hurt me to the core because he's Navo and they, um, that are supposed to value their mothers. That's just, you know, not just Navajos, but, you know, other societies and stuff. So it really helped me um, get to a point where I had to demand that from him, you know, and it was hard for him too, but oh my gosh, finally speaking up about that, um, meeting that support, not only, he's amazing because he does the laundry, everybody's laundry right but he doesn't do all these other things and so we had some really hard conversations and got past that and so now I do feel more supported and it's something that we constantly work at but it it really made me think about like western society and like what um like Christianity marriages um dictate and um how it's different from um uh you know how native people be, view relationships and um, and di the different roles that we um, assume, you know? And so um, how do I do it all? I just, uh, so just, um, just keep, um, you know, praying every day. Use, um, I also um, explore different ways to pray. I took a Quran Verismo class and Oh my God, opened my eyes to so many different ways of self-care, you know, tinctures and massage, cupping. Uh, I mean, I haven't tried some of some of all of it, but just um, drinking marigold tea to help control my blood glucose levels has proven successful for me. And buying myself flowers, you know, just because I enjoy how beautiful and how fragrant they are, you know, has has also helped me. So I'm, um, we'll never like know everything that we need to know to self-care. And that's why we continue to learn and study and research and, um, and change the narrative too. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be about um, pills and all of that or, um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll end there. Thank you so much. I've learned so much, family. Um, and we're going to go ahead and skip to the last question this evening, family. We have been um, talking with our amazing global family of superheroes, learning their wisdom as they, as they have been sharing their experience as superhero parents. Um, we're going to go ahead and finish with Tenant 5, family, walking the thin line between hero and villain. Intelligence is a privilege and it needs to be used for the greater good of people. Dr. Octopus. As superheroes, we must hold ourselves to a higher standard than mere mortals. Therefore, we abide by a moral superhero code. As we understand the thin line between villain and hero. 
We are dedicated to living by a code that guides our actions as we engage in battle. Each moral code is unique and based on the lived experiences of each hero, but always includes the formation of critical consciousness development and the promotion of humanizing action. Furthermore, we pledge to protect and defend our communities, mindful of the moral line between hero and villain. So family, as we think about COVID and how it has affected our lives, one of the things that I always reflect on is um, how I treat people and how when we are stressed out or anxiety ridden or driven by fear, we can be mean. We can um, lash out at other people. We can spread those emotions. Um, so literally also as educated people, um, as people who are pursuing our graduate degrees and have our families, that too is privilege. And so we are literally um, community leaders. Our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, um, our students look up to us. And that itself comes with a certain amount of power. So as we walk through this world as powerhouses um, in all of our communities, we're walking that thin line between hero and villain. So our question today, family, and I do apologize, my sister, um, Andy, she is driving and her call dropped off. Um, but our question this evening, as parents and superheroes, what superhero code, aka what strategies and rules of thumb do you live by and would like to share with our AERA GSE Global family so that we might follow your example? Oh, I'm sorry, Andy, you got, you came back. My apologies, sis. You're fine. Hi, everybody. I just ran up, I just made it home, actually. So my bag is just, <laughs> so I'm going to be quiet so everyone can go so I can hear you all. And I'm back, babe. I'm so glad to see your beautiful face. So family, our question this evening is share your superhero code with us. Let's go ahead and go back to reverse because that was a good idea. So see, that means you would be up. All right, I was gonna say, uh, we should let we just so go first since uh, sometimes she has, I just wanna make sure she can speak so, she, so we can hear her and then I'll go after her. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Dice for uh, leaving me the floor. Yes, it's, it's about time for them to cut the electricity because people are about to wake up. So we have, a, we call it, it's a rotation. Some part of the city has electricity and others are waiting and it's been like that. We are used to it. So we enjoy it, let's say that. Um, and that's part of the survival. So instead of seeing the negative sides of life, which are always there. Focus on the bright sides, focus on the privileges that we have. I am among the less than 1% of people in Madagascar who have internet access and power access people. I have, you know, in the background, we live in a, I have, in a, I have a, the first time after um, we came back, we live in a three bedroom house in Madagascar. We've never had that. I, I was sick of COVID and I got all the medicines needed. And I just got my vitamin C before this and my magnesium and I have zinc and all what everything. And there are other people over there who can barely have food. And I'm so thankful for that. So thank, be thankful for the little you have because if they are taken away from you, you're gonna be horrible. So we all have some sort of privileges. We all have some bright sides of life. So please focus on the bright side. The bad side, the dark side is already this deadly, terrible pandemic. But we still have something. We are still privileged. We have our family. There are people who don't have anyone fighting alone. We still have food. There are people who just go to sleep like that. We still have shelter, you know, the house. There are people like 
my neighbors down there, they live at the school. The school is closed and the school was supposed to be open yesterday, Monday. And we can't because there are still people who lost their houses through the flood. So during this uh, time of uncertainty, please be thankful, be grateful of what you have, either material uh, or it's your happiness or your joy or your family. Thank you. Um, I would say, uh, where is me other you? You are my other me. That's what I try to live by. Uh, it's a poem by Luis Valdez that, that is often used in ethnic studies classrooms. And it basically talks about you know, the second part is, do I smell to you or if I do harm to you or um, I do harm to me, right? And it's basically moving beyond the golden rule. Um, it's not really about how you should treat other people because that's how you want to be treated. It's actually realizing that we are connected and that your actions do impact other folks directly and indirectly. And if we all practice in Lakesh a lot more, you know, we could get through this pandemic um, a lot quicker. We wouldn't have these silly culture war arguments. Um, we wouldn't have, you know, folks censoring Holocaust books like Mouse or trying to um, dictate what teachers can teach and not teach. Because at the end of the day, it would always be about, you know, how, how are my actions reflecting in you? And that's, that's what I would share. Hi, everyone. I would say um, <clears throat> I'm not perfect at it, um, but I try to live by love and kindness. and. I try to remember um, or try and think of everyone I come across of as having the worst possible day of their life. Um, because not that they are having the worst possible day of their life, but you never know what they're going through. Um, you, they could have a smile on their face, but you don't know what just happened in their life. Um, and I think that if we remember and if we think, or at least for me, if I think, oh, if they're going through a really hard day, or a really tough day that you, I would, I tend to be nicer to them. Like if I, if I know a student um, came to me and said someone just passed away like two weeks ago, you know, you tend to be like, okay, yeah, you can have an extension on something um, versus a student who, who didn't, you know? Um, so trying to think in those terms of someone's going through a really hard day or it's going through one of the hardest days of, of their life um, to remind me of loving kindness and being loving and kind towards everybody I come across. Um, I'm not perfect at it and um, perfection will not come in this lifetime, but um, through, I think through, through years and as I, as I grow older and wiser, hopefully I'll come closer to it um, and become I guess, kinder and more loving towards other people. Um, I especially need to work at that when it comes to being a, <laughs> a fierce mom and getting the services for my son, because <laughs> 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 that isn't very loving and kind sometimes. Um, but the, the intention is there. The intention is to always be loved and kind. Um, and I think that that could just help us all be, um, better people towards each other but I loved being here with everyone today I have to get going but everyone it was great being with all of you and have a good evening bye thank you so much Lupe you're always a hero in my book give the new club my nephew thank you so much family um 
That was our final question for the panel today, but I want to go ahead and open it up to the audience. If anyone wanted to go ahead and put something in the chat, are there any burning questions? Um, my panel. Did Song Tree participate? Uh, Song Tree. Yes. Oh, I apologize, Song Tree. My bad. It's okay. Just I understand too. A um, couple of things that came to mind is um, what, what do I live by? And. Um, I recently, uh, one of my mentors is the Honorable Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, and um, I am privileged to get to hear her on a regular basis because of my leadership roles, but she basically says to show up, you know, and so every day when I get up and I don't want to show up, I hear, have her in my ear saying that because that's half the battle, right, is showing up and and then at once you get there and you're the only voice there speaking on behalf of whatever causes, you know, um, you champion, um, just uh, stay strong. And um, because uh, together we're stronger, you know, and so, but basically that's kind of my mantra these days is to show up and I do every day. Thank you so much. Before I open it up to the last word, family, I would not be a good leader if I did not remind you to visit our website at aura.net, follow us on social media at aura.grads, and don't forget to come visit us in person at San Diego for our annual conference, April 21st to the 26th. In addition to that, family, please visit our website for more information. Um, this amazing panel, in addition to the ones that we've been doing, doing throughout the year, as one of our advantages of being part of our global family, this amazing fireside chat will be joining the rest of our fireside chats here at our AERA GSC online library of resources. Every month we've had a panel with its own targeted um, theme, and we've been hearing from our amazing global family. So we look forward to seeing you in San Diego. Um, before we leave family, and again, a special thank you to our amazing panelists slash hashtag superhero parents. Let's go ahead and open it to the floor for anyone who has some last words of wisdom and also to my co-host, my dear sis Andy. I, I just wanna say these fire chats are always so rewarding when I hear you all, it always reminds me that I'm not alone in this fight. And, uh, and things have been kind of rough for me lately, but as you all said, and I love what Song Tree said, just show up and I'll remember that. But these are just always helpful, like I said, and make me feel as though I do have a community, even all the way in Madagascar, that is awesome. So thank you. I mean, I thank you so much. To the panel. Okay, I'll go. I'll go. Um, last message uh, to the AERA GSC. Uh, this storm shall pass. This storm will pass. Hang in there. We can do this. And remember, you are not alone. Continue your fight and be proud of who you are. Thank you. Song to receive, does anyone have any last words? Are there any uh, questions from the audience? Or No, I didn't see any. Not so far. Well, I'll let Santri go first and then uh, I just want to thank um, you, Dre, for um, hosting this fireside chat. It's always illuminating for sure and powerful. And for AERA, for what they do um, nation globally, I was. Uh, fortunate enough to be able to be introduced to it in um, my program of study and such a huge 
uh, network of resources. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dre and um, Andrea as well um, for posting this. Um, I would say, you know, because this is about families and parenting, you know, don't forget the different things we talked about, but most importantly, don't forget, like, we're fighting for our children and other, and our children's children and other children. Um, you know, there's a battle happening right now. I don't, I don't necessarily like that term battle, but I can't think of a better word than that. Uh, and like the whole superhero thing, you know, it aligns, you know, we need to be superheroes for justice um, and not allow folks to roll back to 1960s and 50s and all that stuff. Like, um, again, I'm sick and tired of people trying to pretend that only certain parents matter uh, and that our feelings, our ideas, our hopes and dreams and visions doesn't matter. Thank you so much again to our amazing panelists, my wonderful co-host, and to our entire global family, our audience tonight. Thank you for being the best part of our family. Everyone have a lovely evening and have a great night.